All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is something really exciting. I think I've mentioned it once or twice, and I'm not sure if people, a lot of people picked up on it, but welcome to Disciples of YouTube. This is a YouTuber Disciples multiplayer game. We have five YouTubers competing and five other players assigned to them as Disciples, and we are going to be playing teams against each other in a 10-player middle-age uh, game. And it's going to be hilarious. It's going to be terrible, but also hilarious. I don't know what those little symbols are for. Uh, not honestly too sure. I'm, I, I don't know why Pangea has one, because, like, I'm Ashdod, and that's Ulm. That's my disciple. I don't know why Pangea has a symbol, but uh, we're going to see how it goes. So I am playing as Ashdod, and my disciple is Ulm. And this is my god, Mr. Ed, the Talking Horse, god of Ashdod. So, I took, of course, a trollish Anakite meme, meme bless with Mr. Ed. Uh, quickness, Fire Shock Resistance, and Blood Surge. Pretty solid. Not a huge, incredible meme bless, but a memeish bless nonetheless. Over here we have Ulm, uh, who took a... should have taken a Rainbow Lenormer. Uh, a Rainbow Svartalf Master Smith, rather, for forging purposes. And we, of course, start next to each other, so we should have a nice, safe area here to expand from. Let's look at the other pretenders, shall we? <laughs> so we've got Wilbur Post, Guardian of the Vestibule of Mr. Ed the Talking Horse. Mr. Ed the Talking Horse, himself. We have Team America Freedom Liberty, King Con, the Mouth of Bon Jovi, Bon Jovi, Bald Eagles Scream, uh... <laughs> Sephiroth Weed Lord Goku 420 and XXX Stop Hitting Yourself. Tiny Pony Disciple, My Little Pony. Oh, it's gonna be glorious. So, um, Disciple Games. I'm not sure if you haven't played a Disciples game before. The way it works is you've got one Pretender God, which in our case is Mr. Ed. That Pretender God um, spreads... Uh, the dominion of both players, of both the Disciple and the Pretender, is determined by the Pretender God. The Disciple does not spread his own dominion, he spreads the Pretender God's dominion. So in this case, our dominion is Turmoil 3, Production 3, Cold 1, Growth 2, Misfortune 3, and Drain 3. The reason I took this was, I, I, these are fairly hellish scales to be honest, except I did get Growth and I got Production. Production is vital to produce both Anakites and Middle Age Ulm's extremely heavily armored troops. So if we look at Middle Age Ulm, that's the wrong button. There we go. If we look at Middle Age Ulm, you'll notice their troops have resource costs that are just bonkers. Like one of these Black Plate Infantry costs almost as many resources as one of my Sheshai Anakites. They don't cost much gold though. So Turmoil doesn't bother you too much. The recruitment point cost is very low, so, you know, you don't need a whole lot of income, you don't need a whole lot of recruitment points, you just need resources as Ulm. And if you have the resources, you can pump out a lot of troops very, very effectively. Except for Black Knights, but Black Knights are really expensive in general. Also, your Master Smiths are mundane researchers, so they don't care about Drain. Uh, your Priest Smiths, likewise, also mundane researchers. So Drain 3 doesn't hurt Ulm the way it hurts a lot of other nations. In fact, Drain 3 helps in a way because it boosts your magic resistance in a Drain Dominion. And for Ashdod, Drain 3 does hurt. Drain 3 hurts quite a bit. But your research as Ashdod is coming from mages that give you a fairly decent amount. Um, it's not huge, but it's something. So the inefficiency hurts you less. You don't recruit Emites for research. You recruit Rephite Sages for research, which give you 13 each. So, since you're getting it from giant mages, it hurts you less than it does human nations that are, have people who are starting at like 10 or 11 research points. So, I took it to afford the scales while still getting growth and production. Our strategy here is definitely going to be Anakite heavy to start with for me. He's got an Awake Expander, so our expansion should be pretty decent, hopefully. And then we will um, gather up basically just a ton of resources. You can see Ulm has 300 resources already. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry, that's 300 recruitment points. I wonder why Ulm has 300 recruitment points and I only have 188. Hmm. Despite them being a wasteland and a mountain. Interesting. Well, in any case, um, we're going to lean heavily on having the production capacity to pump out tons of our 
heavily armored and or giant troops. Uh, he'll have Iron Blizzard to back him up and the normal stable of Middle Age Ulm spells and item forging. I, of course, will have mostly Zamzamites. Zamzamites are a big aspect of Ashdod. Now, full disclosure, I have never played Ashdod before in a real game. In a real multiplayer game, I have never played Ashdod against, like, other serious players. So, I am probably going to get just utterly demolished. It's probably going to be embarrassing. But, we will do our best. So, I'm going to recruit a Rephite Sage, two Sheshai Anakites. Uh, if I cancel the Rephite Sage, I could get started on the third one, so that's what I'm going to do. Instead, we'll build a... I can't afford a Kohen either. Hmm... We're just going to recruit no commanders to turn one. We're just going to focus entirely on Anakites. You, of course, are going to become the Prophet, and we will name you... Oh boy, I don't know much about... Uh, I don't actually know much about Mr. Ed Cannon. Who's another character from Mr. Ed? Give me one second here. It's got to be good. I think we're probably going to name our Prophet here... Roger Addison. There we go. He'll become the prophet. Uh, prophet. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot the other interesting thing about Disciples games. You don't get a prophet. Effectively, the Disciple God is your prophet. So you don't get one. Also, you can relinquish provinces to your allied players. So if you have your commanders can move into allied provinces and act just like they're in your own provinces. And at any time, if both players have a commander in a province, the player who technically owns it can give it to the other player. So it doesn't really matter who owns what province in a lot of ways. Now, your armies still cannot fight together. Um, they won't fight on the same side in battles, which is a little bit frustrating sometimes, but it'll work out. So, um, obviously I don't actually have any moves to make right now. We're just going to, like, patrol with Roger Addison because his army I don't I don't think he can turn one expand with just Gileadites and Edomites I think that would be very very dangerous um Edomites are not very good troops Gileadites are solid troops but not like especially solid they could be they could easily be cut down by enough humans and I just don't know what's around me so risky I'll probably want to go there first because that's a mountain that will have more resources these are all just planes, and that's a that's a wasteland. Excuse me. So, let's look at the other pretenders, shall we? So, My Little Pony, Master of the Night Sky, He Who Hungers for the Sun, the Face Painted with Bells. Uh, for Eryu, I believe this is going to be Astral and possibly Death? I don't know what He Who Hungers for the Sun means. In any case playing Eryu, and this is, let me get the, let me get the player list for you real quick, because I'm sure you want to know. Okay, so the players, we have, I am playing Ashdod, uh, Lucid Tactics is playing Bandar Log, Nuclear Monkey is playing Satis, Sack is playing Eryu, uh, Sai is playing Nazca. And what's the other? Who's, who's team five is Sack. I'm team one. Lucid is team two. Nuclear Monkey is team three. Sai is team four. And Sack is team five. Right. And then we have our partners. Uh, Nightmare is playing Marignon. He is Lucid's disciple. Eustace is playing Mechlin. He is Sai's disciple. Uh, Jay Bretton is playing Pangea. He is Nuclear Monkey's partner. And Resok is playing Vanheim. He is Sakane's disciple. And uh, Nasajin is playing Ulm as my disciple. So it's going to be a lot of fun. In any case, Eryu, uh, primarily an air and nature nation. In fact, almost entirely an air and nature nation. They do have a little bit of water and a little bit of earth from the Bane Sheet. Uh, but beyond that, they don't have any Astral, they don't have any Death or Blood or anything like that. Troop-wise, they've got Furbolg, and Furbolg are good troops. Uh, that said, they are good troops for the early era, and they're a little bit less good in the middle era. Still pretty solid. They also have uh, Milesians, 
who are... I mean, Milesians are basically slightly improved independent infantry. They do have Milesian slingers, which are incredibly cheap. And they have air and nature income. Fun fact about Eriu, they're one of the very few nations who has mounted commanders but no mounted troops. So if you set archers to fire at cavalry against Eriu, they will always shoot at Tuathas and Sihi lords. Wilbur Post, of course, we've seen. He's middle age all. Bon Jovi is the pretender of Marignan. Middle age Marignan is a fire and astral nation. They don't really have much else. They do have architects who can build special forts. Their witch hunters have only fire and astral. Their Grand Masters can also random air and earth. So Marignan can set up communions. However, their cheapest mages don't have astral. You have to get witch hunters in order to get communion slaves, and they're fairly expensive to be communion slaves. Uh, Troop-wise, Marignan's troops are not great. They do have flagellants, which are foreign recruit sacred units, but they're bad. So flagellants tend to pretty much die. They do have crossbowmen, and recruitable national crossbowmen are not terribly, terribly common in the Middle Era, so that's a nice Benny. Uh, they've got Swordsmen, which are high damage troops, effectively barbarians wearing armor. They've got Halberdiers, which are good castle defenders and do a lot of damage. They've got Pikeneers, which were a lot better in Dominions 4. They have Men-at-Arms, who are bodyguards who have pretty solid stats overall. And then they have the Royal Guard, which are slightly better heavy cavalry. And they have the Knights of the Chalice, which are slightly even better Sacred Heavy Cavalry. Knights of the Chalice are pretty solid. Income-wise, they've got uh, Fire and Astral, and they kill demons and undead in their capital. Bald Eagles Scream, the slaver of Team America Freedom Liberty. This is the disciple of Team America. Let's actually, let's go through the, um, let's go through the... Oh, I've lost my words. Let's go through the Pretenders first, and then we'll go through the Disciples. So, uh, Stop Hitting Yourself is the next Pretender. He is the Pretender of Pangea, and this is played by, remind myself real quick, that's Jay Breton, who is actually, who is partnered with Nuclear Monkey, but I guess he's actually playing the, um, I think he's, but he's actually playing the, uh, the Pretender, interesting. So Nuclear Monkey is playing Satis, and he is the Disciple. I guess probably because he wanted Pangea to get to pick the Bless. Okay. So Middle Age Pangea is um, sort of brutally overpowered. I mean, you have the Dryads, who are stealthy seducers with nature magic, which means they're also the perfect assassin. Um, you have Pans, who have high-level earth and nature magic, plus a small chance of blood. And then you have Pandemoniacs, who have just straight blood. Just nature and blood. Um, it's a little bit... It's a little powerful. Uh, on top of that, you have the Centaurides, who have water and nature. You have the White Centaurs, who are still really, really good. You have uh, Centaur Warriors and Centaur Cataphracts, who have high armor, but do not cost as many resources as normal heavy cavalry, interestingly. So, they're a little bit underpriced for what they do. Uh, also, the standard centaur warriors are stealthy and berserking, as is usual for Pangea. And then you have satyr hoplites, and satyr hoplites are one of the better hoplites in the game. So that's very, very solid. On top of that, of course, Pangea has national spells. They can do things like uh, they can create forts in forests by casting a spell instead of actually paying for it. And their forts are primitive still, but their temples are also half price in forests. So Pangea just has a lot of... Uh, a lot of advantages, uh, including these revelers. Revelers are 16 gold, 3 resources for a stealthy berserker with recuperation. I mean, it causes a little tiny bit of unrest and is undisciplined, but still, this is a 2 attack size 2 high level berserker unit for very, very cheap. They're extremely strong. Pangea's income is entirely nature. They don't even get any death gems to start off with, but Despite that, they're very powerful. Except Minotaurs. Minotaurs aren't very powerful. Um, they're Berserkers and they trample, but they're only size 3 and their stats are low. And, meh, don't even bother. Uh, King Kong. The Mouth of Bon Jovi. Nope, that's Bon Jovi. We've got that, I think. We've already looked at My Little Pony, so I think the only other pretender to look at is Team America Freedom Liberty of Nazca. Nazca... Now, okay, so we've got Nazca and Mictlan on a team together. 
right? Uh, they're both very sacred dependent. Middle-aged Mictlan is different from early and late in that it has no blood. Instead, it has nature and astral in a big way, and some air as well. The High Priest of the Sky, for example, is a guaranteed two air mage, and the Mictlan Priest randoms astral sometimes. Uh, and they have the same old... Don't they also have the... Yeah, they have the same old Nahualis, so they can form communions with them as well. Uh, then all of these are still cap only, which is fine. Uh, their only recruit anywheres are the Mictlan Priests and the Nahualis. But they also have these Kawadals they can recruit in the capital now, which are flying, inspirational, big astral and nature mages with the potential to also be air. And they still have they still have uh, Jaguar Warriors, which are exactly the same, but in the Middle Age they mostly use Eagle Warriors, which can fly when they're blessed and have two attacks. So Eagle Warriors basically take advantage of the same bless that the Nazcan Sacreds do. Uh, the Sun Guard, the Condor Warriors, and their summonable Condors, which they can summon in huge amounts. Uh, Team America Freedom Liberty, the Hungry Earth, the Bloodlusting Lord, the Man Eater. So clearly he's taken death. Interesting that he didn't take a whole lot of air, it looks like. But he's taken blood and earth, I believe? I think that's what this means. Uh, and so he's taken... He's, I imagine, I imagine he's taken a memeish bless to equal my own uh, and is going to be swarming people with condors, which is what Nazca usually does. We've got King Kong, the mouth of Bon Jovi, in Bandar Log. Bandar Log is an interesting nation. They're not one of the stronger ones, but they do have tiger riders, and tiger riders are pretty good sacreds. Uh, they have forest and forest survival. They're animals which is actually a little bit of a weakness, and they have fairly low magic resistance for Sacreds, but their attack skill is really high, their, at their attack skill is high, their defense skill is quite high, and their attacks are very, very solid. So their claws and their bite, they get three attacks each, so they get six attacks out of a square. And they have decent protection, very high defense, they're very, very solid. They also reincarnate occasionally, which is interesting, but doesn't really affect the game much. Uh, what is Bon Jovi's Bless? Master of Fate, Destroyer of Demons. King of Kings. Okay, that's Fire and Astral. I mean, that's just straight Fire and Astral, I think. Huh. It'll be interesting to see what people went for. And, of course, this is Earth and Nature and Princess of Poetry and Song. Not sure what that is. Might be astral, might be nature. I don't know. In any case, this is going to be a good old time. Throne-wise, we have, we need 13 ascension points to become the new god. And we have 1, 2, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Really? We need 13 out of 18? Oof. It's going to be rough. Yeah, 14, 18, okay. So we've got the Throne of Abundance, which gives us a whole bunch of gems and sloth. The Throne of Eternal Suffering, which gives us order, productivity, and misfortune. Fortune, which gives us luck. Gaia, which gives us growth. Knowledge, which gives us the Lore Master and the Sage. Ooh, that would be pretty cool. The First Age, which gives us magic. The Second Age, which gives us strength. War gives attack skill and morale. Pestilence gives death and death gems. And Might gives more strength. Interesting. Okay. So... This is going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be a good, good time. I anticipate I'm going to get brutally ruined. Um, looking at the teams, we're a fairly, we're a fairly cancerous team. The Ash Dot Ohm combination, but the uh, the Nazca Mictlan combination, I think, is going to give us a run for our money. And, uh, well, Vanheim and Eru, I don't think, is all that bad. It's a lot of air magic. It's a lot of air magic. But, uh, we'll see what's going on. It'll be fun. Anyway, that's the first turn. Uh, we're going to be uploading these videos on a synchronized schedule. So when I upload this video, I'm going to have links in the description. Look down there right now and double check to make sure I'm not lying to you. I'm going to have links in the description to the other YouTube channels of the other YouTubers involved in this. And we're going to upload at the same time as much as we can. At least some of us, I think Lucid and I at least, are going to be uploading simultaneously. So... You can basically follow the game as you go along 
by looking at the other people's channels and seeing the same thing from different perspectives if you like, which I think will be a really cool little adventure. All of us have agreed not to look at each other's channels, at each, other, at each other's videos on this game until the game is over. We're going to be publishing them 15 turns behind, so when turn 15 rolls around we'll be free to publish turn 1, and we'll see how things go. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, folks, welcome back. Disciples of YouTube turn two, a.k.a. the first turn in which things actually happen. As we can see here, my disciple has wisely not blind expanded. This army is commanded by Wilbur Post, the Svartov Mastersmith. Good for him. In here, I now have 125 gold. So, um, let me see. I could start recruiting an Adon uh, just to be safe. That is actually what I'm going to do, although that means I can't recruit even one Sheshai Anakite this turn. Ugh, feels bad. Oh, that fe that does kind of feel bad. But to be honest, against these independents, three or four will actually do fine. Um, let's take these two. We're going to put them in that group. You. Oh, I screwed up. Yes, I did. I screwed up. Right well. Okay, so here's how I screwed up. Let me explain this in case you didn't realize. I forgot when I started this game, and when I played turn one, I had forgotten one of the critical facts about Disciples games, which is that you don't get a profit. Wilbur Post over here is effectively my profit, because he's my disciple. Not having a profit, and not profitizing this guy, Roger Addison, means that he can't cast holy spells because he's not a priest because he's not a prophet get me so he can't actually bless these anakites so it's okay it's not a critical error it's merely a regular old fuck up um what i'm gonna do instead is i'm going to recruit a kohen and we're gonna have to go with kohen expansion at least for this first gang so this kohen is going to end up with four sheshai anakites and he will take them. Fortunately, I'm surrounded by fairly weak independents, so I can make this work. Like this province, Addison's army can take that province. No problem. We're going to set these guys in a line. We're going to set them all the way forward. We're going to tell them to attack closest. Mr. Roger Addison will hold and stay behind troops. As is traditional, we're going to bind that to key 9 so that I'll have it on easy access. Uh, they'll be able to take this province, they'll be able to take a few more provinces, they will peter out eventually, but uh, four enraged Cheshire Anakites with a Kohen will still be able to take provinces as well. Uh, like this one, they can take this province. Might not want to take 30 Barbarians. 30 Barbarians might be able to beat down four Cheshire Anakites. Uh, six Cheshire Anakites would absolutely ruin their day. And in fact, this army might be able to ruin their day if it's really only 30 of them. I mean, they'll deal damage, but my my units do have re relatively high hit points. Well, I don't like their stats, though. Edomites kind of have crappy stats. Like attack skill 9? No thank you. But they do have javelins. Gileadites are a lot better, though. Just really a lot better. If you compare them, Edomites... Gileadites cost um, double everything except recruitment points, basically. Uh, Amorites do have that nice little poison spear. And they actually cost fewer resources. Oh, it's two fewer resources for two fewer points of protection? What? That's weird. That is a very small difference in price for two points of protection. And I also, of course, have Gileadite archers, which are very, very tough. Very, very expensive archers. Um, Bashanites ain't bad either. I mean, none of these guys are bad in terms of stats. They're just expensive, like really expensive. I mean, 50 gold is more than most nations pay for their elite sacred units. And Bashanites are decent troops, but elite sacreds, they ain't. Uh, the only thing they really have going for them is strength 20. Like, if I'm going to be paying those kinds of prices... I would rather, if I'm going to be paying 50 gold for a Bashanite, I would rather just suck it up and pay double the price for a Sheshai Anakite, who is far superior in every way, and Berserks, and Sacred. 
you know? It's like, why would I, why would I pay a lower price for this guy when I could just pay for this guy, and this guy can kill Bashanites two to one, like, without, I would wager, much of a problem, especially with the Quickness Bless. So, that's going to be the plan. Roger Addison will lead his army to take this province, and then we'll figure out which of these provinces he's going for. Next turn, I will send an Anakite gang to take this province, which will give us a ton of resources. Actually, yeah, that would be a great province to take next, just because of the extra resources. And we still have Mr. Ed researching, so our research is actually shockingly solid. Um... In case you're wondering about why I'm researching what I'm researching, it is because, as I said before, I have never played Ashdod in a multiplayer game, so I don't honestly know if this is a great idea. But I feel like it is. I feel like going down enchantment to get some of these some of these death and astral spells is a decent idea early on. Um, and like I said, I want to try using reanimation because. Ashdod does get special skeletons, the Long Dead Rephites, and I feel like that could potentially give me a boost. Um, I'll have some death gems built up by the time I recruit an Emite or a Zamzumite, and so I'll be able to spend them uh, reanimating some skeletons to boost my early armies without really feeling bad about it. And from there, we will just uh, just proceed, just go along as we go along. It'll be a good time. I think we're going to do decently well. I do want to take this province pretty soon because I want to push over this way and link up with Ulm. I imagine we'll discuss how we're divvying up territory, and of course we can always swap provinces without a problem, without losing any income or anything. I imagine Ulm is going to definitely want all of these provinces that are near Ulm itself just to boost his resource count because recruiting as Ulm is, oof, is hard in the early game. I mean... The resource cost is so intense on those on those infantry. Like my giants, this Bashanite still I think costs fewer resources than most black plate infantry. Possibly fewer than any black plate infantry. So definitely uh Ulm is definitely gonna want all of his cap circle provinces, except this one because it's across a river. Uh, although I do since I do have a cold dominion cold one it'll be passable most of the time well we'll talk about it but uh for right now that is going to be turn two after i hit enchantment a little ways i'm going to well see you can see by my mages my main mages are of course going to be rephite sages which get fire earth and astral uh zamzumites are my other main mage and they get earth and death and then a smattering of fire and astral but primarily earth and death Earth and Death are really, really good enchantment paths. They're also decent alteration paths. Earth is a fantastic alteration path, and Death is an okay alteration path. Um, in alteration, the Earth-Death cross path gives you Blight, which is actually a pretty solid remote attack spell. Kills 5% of the population outright, and costs the owner 80 gold, and increases unrest. Blight is a good one. Um, arouse Hunger, similarly decent remote attack spell, summons about 20 ghouls that can be used to take uh, very, very lightly defended provinces. And then, of course, once you get up to level 5, you can cast Maws of the Earth and Iron Warriors and things like that. Petrify, potentially. Iron Bane. Uh, I can't cast Iron Pigs, sadly. I would kind of like to cast Iron Pigs. It's not a good spell for Ashdod, but it would be hilarious. And then once you get up to level 6, Death lets you cast Soul Vortex and Darkness and all that kind of good stuff. Bone Grinding eventually. So definitely, definitely Alteration. Uh, Enchantment has most of the Death Summons, including Pale Riders is a great one. And of course, Horde of Skeletons, the Death Combat spell. And then once you go up to level 6, you have Rigor Mortis. Now, a lot of these spells have high path requirements, but... But, 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 my Zamzamites, 25% of them have an Astral Random. And if I have the Astral Earth cross path, I can forge Crystal Matrixes that will let any of them lead a Communion. And I do have a few expensive Communion Slaves. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm starting to get hoarse again. So, when I need to cast one of those expensive High Path spells, I can form a small Communion to do so. 
Communing, communioning is not Ashdod's primary combat strategy. It's expensive for them and it's difficult. But, but, you have the option. The option exists. Most of your, your three main mages all do have at least astral randoms. And Emites get the astral death cross path, which is actually pretty impressive. So, you can do communion stuff to an extent. If I find independent communion slaves, I will be extremely happy. But we'll see if that happens. So, thanks for watching. I will see you in turn three.